and welcome everybody uh, to the first QBI online seminar. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is a weird time. And one of the things that we miss most about this time is interacting uh, with scientists from around the world uh, who come to visit us in seminars or who we meet up with at meetings. Uh, and a lot of uh, great online communities have been forming to uh, continue that wonderful tradition of scientific sharing. And QBI um, is adding to that through this seminar series. And we're really happy to welcome Gira as the inaugural uh, speaker. So Professor Baba uh, is at uh, the NYU School of Medicine, where she runs a joint lab with Damien Eckert. Uh, and prior to that, she is well known to many of us are, are, uh, on this call as a, as a postdoc at UCSF, where she worked with uh, Ron Vale, doing really remarkable work on the allosteric mechanisms of motor proteins. Um, prior to that, uh, I first got to know Gira when she was a graduate student at the Scripps Research Institute uh, down south, where she worked with Peter Wright on the dynamics of DHFR, really producing landmark uh, papers uh, during her graduate work. And, and that was when uh, you know, I first became a huge fan of, of her work. Uh, and we've been friends since then. And, and uh, Gira is one of my favorite uh, people in science and, and just a, and a remarkably creative and, and fearless uh, Scientist. So, as you'll see uh, today, she's taken on a new organism and is doing a whole bunch of techniques. Wow! As you can hear, even the Hell's Angels, who uh, are you know in the neighborhood of Petrero Hill, are big fans, giving her a little salute uh, in the background. Uh, but she, you know, fearlessly integrates not just the biophysical tools that she was trained on as a graduate student. The, the tools of structural biology, but now cell biology and cool genetics. And um, I'm, I always just uh, love talking to her so much. I, I, miss, uh, I miss her not being in California, but this is the, the next best thing. So Gira, um, welcome to UCSF. Welcome back to UCSF. Welcome to QBI. We'll look forward to uh, hearing from you. And folks, you can submit questions using the Q&A function um, during the talk. I'll be monitoring that, and I will do my best to interrupt Gira if things are unclear. Uh, and at the end, we'll we'll have a, a conversation. I'll I'll try to do a mix between asking questions myself that people submit and trying to enable those people to to talk themselves. So we'll we'll, we'll try and experiment a little bit with that at the end. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, Gira. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for the invitation and. Um, this is my first Zoominar, so please feel free to interrupt if things are not going well. Um, okay, so I'm really excited to tell you all about this project today, which is actually a pretty new project in our lab, so I'd love to get your feedback and questions at the end. And it is about a really weird parasite called Microsporidia, um, which is depicted here uh, at the bottom, infecting a cell that is in the top right corner of the screen. Okay, so what are microsporidia? So um, microsporidia are parasites that can infect a pretty wide range of hosts. Um, so I'm gonna show you a few examples. They can infect silkworms. You see uh, infected silkworms here uh, with pepper disease, and this has caused sort of decimation of silkworm populations in the past. Um, they can also infect aquatic animals, and they cause uh, what's known as slow growth syndrome, uh, which basically results in very tiny aquatic animals. This has also resulted in a lot of economic losses in countries that depend on this um, as one of their main economies. And of course, they can also infect a multitude of organs in, um, in humans. In uh, immunocompromised patients, this can be fatal. Most often, they infect the small intestine, but also they can infect muscle, lungs. Um, they can be tissue specific or they can be systemic. So um, they are these little bugs that have a really wide range of hosts. They also have an incredibly reduced genome. So I'm just showing you here, kind of drawn to scale, the area of the circles represents the scale of the genomes, um, that they, uh, how they compare with some other common things. Um, so they are actually a little bit smaller than E. coli, 
And there's kind of two uh, interesting things about this. One is that uh, uh, the genome is very reduced. Many of the proteins are actually not uh, homologous to anything we really understand or know well. Um, and the other part is that because their genomes are so reduced, uh, they also are obligate intracellular parasites. So they depend on their host for survival. Um, so I'm just going to dive in and show you what they look like when they infect a host cell. Uh, so I'm just showing you here some kidney epithelial cells. So these are uh, vir viral cells infected with microsporidia. Uh, each of the little yellow parasites you see here is a microsporidia parasite. So they form spores. Um, they're unicellular and closely, most closely related to fungi. So here you're seeing a cell that's pretty heavily infected. You can see that uh, the microsporidia kind of cluster around the nucleus, then the actin is also stained just to, to give you a sense of where, the, where they are. Um, so once they're fully infected, they'll be released from the host cell. And at this stage, they're non-replicative. So the spores are the only, uh, only form of this parasite that can survive outside a host cell. And on, in order to replicate, they will have to infect a new host cell. And so my whole talk today is going to be about how do they actually infect their host, a new host cell. Okay, so exactly 100 years ago, actually, um, it was noted that microsporidia have this really weird tube that comes out of them. So this is a hand drawing um, of what something that was observed in a microscope, and you can see uh, this unicellular spore, and then you can see this filamentous stuff that comes out of it. Um, and if we look at that, you know, fast forward a few years, uh, you can have a little bit of a better picture of what this looks like. You can see the spore, um, you can see this polar tube that comes out of it, and now you can see that this tube uh, sits against a host cell. And so generally the hypothesis is that this really long tube, the polar tube, is important for infecting uh, the host cell. And so I'm just, I just want to show you what this looks like under a light microscope because you're going to see a lot of it. And so here we have the spore body down um, on the right. You have the polar tube. And if you look carefully at the other end, there's some sort of infectious material at the other end of this tube. Um, and that whole long tube has to be packaged inside the spore. So uh, before we really get into anything, I want to give you a sense of how, how does this really work? How does this tube come out of a spore? Um, and just so you have a, a, a kind of more realistic idea of what I'm talking about. And so, uh, because I don't know how this, how movies are gonna show on each of your screens, in the chat window, you'll find a list of movies and on the slide, I'll name the corresponding movie. And so if it doesn't look good when I play it, then just uh, click on that link and hopefully it'll work. Um, okay, so this is how it really works. So what you should be seeing, um, I hope, is uh, in about one it point- look, It looks great for me. Okay. Playing here, yeah. So. Um, okay, so at the bottom right is the spore. Um, and from it, you see this tube shoots out really quick. At the other end of the tube, you have some infectious material that comes out that we'll talk about later. And so in theory, the host cell would be on the top left of the screen. And this is in real time. So the whole process happens in about 1.6 seconds. So if we then ask, well, what does this tube look like inside the spore? So this is, uh, these, this is a TEM section from a, one microsporidia species, and there's data on pretty much all microsporidia species like this from many different labs. Um, and what you'll see here are these coils, and these are the polar tube coils when they're inside the spore, that is the inactive spore before it has fired its tube. So you can see from uh, just this slice that the tube is basically thought to be coiled up inside the spore. Um, in this way. And so that leads us to kind of uh, what really got me interested in this, this project, which is you have a, a single cell spore inside it that's, you know, some kind of proteinaceous tube that is coiled up almost like a spring. Um, on some trigger that tube will get released. We don't really understand what the trigger is yet, um, but when it's released, the tube will become linear. It's then hollow and the hypothesis is that cargo will be transported through that tube into the host cell to initiate infection of the host cell. So really um, the question is how is this uh, sort of harpoon-like organelle deployed? Um, which in order to answer that question, I think we first need to know how is it actually packed in the spore? And you know, what are the kinetics of this firing? How does it really work? 
And of course, I was incredibly interested in understanding what kind of proteins actually generate this filament. They have to be something that support both the coiling as well as this linear tube. And they have to be able to make this uh, huge conformational change uh, that you see kind of macroscopically within apparently a couple of seconds, or I'll show you later even in milliseconds. Um, and so these were the kind of questions that got me uh, really excited about looking into this, this project. Um, so the main drawback of this project is that these organisms are not genetically modifiable. And so many of the initial experiments one would do, like tagging different proteins and just asking what, where they are or what they're doing during infection is, is simply not possible. And so that makes it really challenging to study. And for that reason, um, the approach that we've taken is uh, entirely based on imaging. And so what we're doing is um, from the point of view of looking at the organism itself and its infection in host cells and now also some organoid systems, we use uh, optical microscopy. Um, coming at it from the other side, um, we're doing some structural biology and biochemistry on different, uh, different proteins that actually make up this tube. Um, and then a direction that's sort of new for me and uh, super exciting is more of the sort of structural cell biology, where we're really hoping um, that by using some of these newer techniques as well as some older ones, we can really kind of get at the native structure at a bit higher resolution. And then my dream is that we can kind of come at it from both ends and meet in the middle and I could give you a much better description of what's going on. Um, so as I said, it's a new project in the lab, so that's the idea, we're not there yet. Uh, but today I'll tell you a little bit about um, the optical microscopy that we're doing, looking at these firing kinetics, how the polar tube is packed, and hopefully some insights into the mechanism of this polar tube firing event. So before I start, I should say this uh, project has really been led by a great postdoc in the lab, Michael, and uh, we were super lucky that he even wanted to work on this project because the project didn't exist before he joined the lab, so everything that I show you has really been established by him. Um, we've also worked really closely with our microscopy core, both for the um, EM and the light microscopy I'll show you. And we have a great high school student, Alina, who's done all of the segmentation of the EM data that I'll show you as well. Um, and in case the movie links in the chat window don't work, they're also all on BioArchive. Okay, so let's get into how the polar tube is packed in the spore in the first place. So to answer this question, we felt that we really needed a 3D reconstruction of this because there wasn't, there wasn't otherwise a good way to know how it's packed. And so to understand this, we used serial block phase scanning electron microscopy. And so this essentially allows us to obtain uh, 3D slices through many different spores in a high throughput way. Um, so we can have a block. So what you see here is um, a block of resin that has a lot of different spores pack in, packed into it. And sort of in an overnight data collection also, we can kind of go through um, all of them and you can slice through and get uh, information through, it, through the entire spore for many spores in different orientations. Um, okay, so we had this uh, data set. And so if I show you a slice through it, um, what you'll see is that the resolution is kind of lower than TEM imaging for sure, but the advantage is really being able to get through the whole thing such that we could construct it in 3D. And the questions that we were asking, I think didn't need um, to be at higher resolution at this point. So on the left is just a, a slice as it is, and on the right is uh, showing you what we segmented uh, out of this representative slice. So we could segment kind of many organelles um, that I'll come to some of them later, but let's just focus on the polar tube in blue, which is what we were really after in the beginning. So by getting a 3D model um, of the polar tube, uh, so that was pretty easy to trace, and so here, um, Alina was able to go in uh, through all the slices and you can kind of get a really good sense of how this tube is coiled inside the spore as well as how it's kind of anchored to the spore wall. Um, and so this uh, lets us do several things. So for one thing, it tells us uh, the actual three-dimensional arrangement of that polar tube in the spore. So here I'm showing you two potential models that have been um, you know, circulated in the literature. You could have imagined that the tube comes down from the anterior end all the way to the posterior and then starts coiling up. Or you could imagine that it comes down just, uh, just a little bit and then starts coiling up. Um, and from the serial block face imaging, it's very clear that the second model is, is correct. 
Um, and I think this will later have implications for uh, our understanding of how it might then get released. Um, and so we, we can clearly see that model two is correct. Um, another thing that was actually pretty interesting that we noticed, so we did this now for um, uh, 20 spores from two different species. So we reconstructed 40 different spores and the um, polar tube is always a right-handed helix. And, uh, you know, initially we didn't go into it thinking that because you can imagine if you, um, let's say you have a fire hose or something and you kind of like coil it up randomly, it, it could go in either direction. But this tells us that there is either some polarity in the polymer that makes this tube, kind of like there is in, in microtubules or DNA, um, or alternatively, maybe in the machinery that actually assembles it as it's developed. Um, but it, so we, we don't know why it is so, but it definitely has a very specific uh, chirality. The other thing we could tell was that this, uh, tube, this whole tube is kind of packed at an angle relative to the anterior posterior axis of the spore. Um, and that was also consistent between the two different species that we looked at. Um, and so, so those are some of the kinds of information we could get about the polar tube. Um, and then the other thing that we could do is look at all these different organelles. So um, we can, the ones that I would like to point out, the, there's the purple one, which is actually a stack of membranes. I'm going to show it to you in 3D in a second. Um, there's the green one, the anchoring disc, and that's important because that actually anchors the polar tube to the spore wall. And, it's, and if you notice at the top here, you kind of have a break in the yellow uh, piece here, and that's going to be where the polar tube actually fires from. Okay, so, so we're able to now see how this polar tube is packed relative to these other organelles in the spore. And so what you'll see is this purple polaroplast thing um, kind of really wraps around that anterior linear region of the polar tube. Um, and there's a vacuole <coughs> at the bottom that has been um, implicated in, in the firing as well. The idea is that it might swell during polar tube firing. Um, and as you can see, the anchoring just kind of anchored it to the top of the, of, uh, the spore. So, so now we had some sort of spatial information about how this tube is actually packaged in the spore. And the next thing we wanted to get was some time resolution. So what are really the kinetics of polar tube firing? And one other question we had was whether this was different in different species of microsporidia. Um, because you, yeah. A question before we move on from the, uh, the kinetics or move on to the kinetics. Uh, Arthur asks, what's the total length of the tube coiled inside the cell? How does that compare to the length once it's released? Uh, you know, give us a sense of the length scale. Yeah, I'm gonna get. I, I, I'm gonna get to the difference in length, but uh, the, it is on a, the order of a hundred microns or so. Um, so the the fully fired tube is about a hundred microns, and I'll show you that um, actually it's shorter inside. Okay, so I'll keep going with the with the kinetics. Um, so. Okay, so here we're going to look at two different species, uh, which I'll just introduce to you. So one is called uh, Algerae and the other one we can call Helum. Uh, they're not very closely related. Uh, the Algerae is bigger, Helum is a little bit smaller. Uh, Algerae does have two nuclei, uh, which you can keep in mind because we'll, we'll watch them later. Um, the Algerae is kind of interesting because it can actually infect mosquitoes and humans, which is not that common in Microsporidia, um, whereas Helum infects uh, only humans. We kind of picked these also for feasibility reasons because we could propagate them in the lab also to the scales that we later wanted to do more, um, more like structural biology or even for the serial block based SEM, we needed quite a few spores. And uh, we also knew from the literature the firing conditions so we don't really know what triggers tube germination in vivo but we knew that using uh, optimizing these conditions of either high ph or hydrogen peroxide we could get them to trigger in vitro um so now we're going to just look at them in vitro so you already so saw gear up um you know people i guess yifan was interested in uh, originally in like what is the what is the trigger uh which i guess is somewhat you know, answered here, but then also just by shifting these uh, Guillaume asks, like, you know, does it happen spontaneously? Is there, are there rules that, that you can work out um, already? 
Yeah, so that's a super interesting question about the trigger. Uh, I mean, we we really we don't know. There's some hypotheses of a potential in in vivo of a receptor um, that may be involved, but it, it's not very clear. And so, in vivo triggers are really not well understood at this point. So usually, from what what I've seen in the literature, people discover a new species. They'll often try almost like a almost like a crystallization screen, but you know, just trying a, a bunch of different things. And for most of them, it's the pH. I feel that is is the thing. Although it's high pH, so it doesn't necessarily tell us about physiolo anything physiological. Um, and, and then the, are these are these BSL two or three or uh, no? These are BSL two. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and so then about the rate, it can vary a bit. So in, it even can vary prep to prep. So you can have say uh, sometimes seventy five percent will germinate, sometimes only forty five percent will germinate. But I have to say I'm not uh, completely confident that the uh, purified spores are all at the completely mature stage either because at least looking from the serial block based SEM there's certainly some that seem to not not have a fully formed polar tube so it could be that a purification method isn't getting completely mature spores and that's also affecting the, the rate of germination so to speak. I guess Yifan wants to elaborate you know whether you know anything about the directionality of fires whether there's it know how it senses there's a target there. We assume the firing is irreversible, so economically it should know that there's a target. How you think about that? And then, so it and is, then in, in honor of his election to the National Academy of Sciences during this pandemic period, I'll allow him one more question after this. Um, <laughs> um, okay, well then he can ask any number of questions, but um, yeah, we, so I think they're all great questions. We, um, so the so it was the directionality. So we don't really know directionality. Yes, it's not reversible. So it's not like the chytrid fungus that can reel back its uh, cilium or something. So it's it's not reversible. Um, and I so I can get back to this maybe in the discussion. Um, I'm not so convinced that it would actually pierce the host cell. Uh, it may be more like a tissue level trigger that is actually triggering this and it's even possible that the stuff that comes out of it is then um, kind of phagocytosed by a cell as well but maybe we could revisit that discussion at the end after you see some of the cargo transport as well um, okay so uh, so what we first did uh, was optimize some high-speed optical microscopy to look at the firing kinetics of the algerase species that I told you about. Um, and so you already saw this movie, but I'll just uh, remind you the spore is at the bottom, tube is shoot shooting out, it's in real time, the host cell in theory would be at the top left. Um, and if we look at it in a more intelligible way here as a chymograph, um, what you can see is that there's three main phases here. In the first phase, uh, the polar tube actually extrudes and reaches its full length. In the second stage, you don't see any change in length of the um, tube itself. We think that's when the uh, cargo will be transported through the tube. And then at the end, you can see some cargo emerge um, at the end of the tube. So we did the same thing then for uh, Helm, And what you're gonna see here is that it's actually much faster. The whole process is done in about 500 milliseconds. Um, and otherwise, I mean, the general, general mechanism looks the same, though there are some differences in that this one is always more curved than the other for what it's worth. Um, and so if we compare uh, just a chymograph of these two, you can see that the firing kinetics are a bit different. Another difference I'll point out is that in stage two, that is where the uh, tube is not extending anymore. This species spends much less time in that that stage. Uh, so there are some differences in the kinetics of these two species. And so we also looked at a third one uh, that I'll throw in the mix here, which is an orange, and that's very closely related to Helm. And so what you can see here is that those two are similar in um, terms of their kinetics. So the dark lines are just a fit and the um, light lines at the back are each individual spore. Um, and so here you can see that the two closely related species do have more similar kinetics than the other one. 
um, and their lengths are also smaller. So that's a question about uh, polar tube length. So for algae, it's kind of around 100, uh, though there is some variability, as you can see, and shorter for the helaman and intestinalis. Um, they do reach maximum velocities of almost uh, 400 microns per second, which is fast compared to most uh, processes, and maximum accelerations of about 12,000 microns per second squared. Um, okay, and the other thing that uh, we thought was interesting that was also an observation is that if you just keep imaging for a whole 10 seconds or so, you'll see that this tube actually uh, shortens afterwards. And so this happens for pretty much all, uh, every spore that we looked at for this species, um, but it happens to different extents in different species. And so this, um, you know, in and of itself, I can't tell you what it means, but it does give us a hint that the properties, the mechanical properties are somewhat different uh, for different species of, of these tubes. So um, coming back to the question about the length, so we were also really interested in knowing whether the length when it's packaged inside the spore matches the length when it's outside. Um, the length in the inside comes from the serial block face imaging and the length from the outside is from light microscopy. So we did first um, validate the ability to actually compare the lengths from these two techniques and we did that by measuring the spore size itself. Um, and th those seem uh, like very comparable. So we think it's okay to use the two different techniques to measure length. And um, when we do that, you can see that the length outside is about twice that of the length inside. And so that um, tells us, uh, I mean, it could mean many things, but I think my um, favorite hypothesis is that whatever is making up the, the protein, the repeating unit of the proteins that are making up this filament undergo, could each undergo a conformational change that leads to an ex difference in the length outside. Um, of course, it could be something completely different, like membrane rearrangement or some, something else. So don't know what it is yet, but something is different. It's not just a spring that is going from the inside to the outside. Okay, so um, the, um, the, the next part that I want to focus on is, well, how is the infectious material or cargo or whatever actually has to make it to the host cell, how is that transported through the polar tube? Um, and now we're kind of set up with an assay to look at this polar tube firing. So all we need to do is have some kind of marker for the cargo. So this was a question that I was actually, this was probably one of the first questions that I was really interested in answering. And so I was pretty excited when we actually got to the point that we could answer it. And the reason is that uh, we know that at least the nucleus, we don't know exactly what goes through the tube, but we know that the nucleus for sure has to make it through the tube into the host cell. And the nucleus is much larger than the tube. So drawn a, a bit to scale here, so but it's about seven times in diameter. And so either this tube is gonna have to be flexible enough to accommodate the nucleus, um, or the nucleus is gonna have to be able to squeeze through that tube. And so to uh, address this question, we first needed to be able to see the nucleus in the first place. And I told you we don't have the luxury of doing any genetics. Um, and so what we did was, uh, so the other challenge is that there's a pretty thick uh, chitin wall around the spore. Uh, which makes it difficult to get a lot of things in. And so we screened a bunch of dyes and uh, Nuke Blue, which is a Hooke's derivative, seemed to work for us. So we were able to stain um, the nuclei. And so this species has two, two nuclei. We were able to stain these uh, using Nuke Blue and it was able to get in pre-germination as well. So now what I'm going to show you is we will watch the nucleus um, as it actually leaves the spore to travel down, oh, so the nuclei as they uh, leave the spore to travel down the tube. So here um, the inset shows you a movie of what's going on in the spore and uh, because we have bright field imaging as well, you can see the tube coming out too. Um, so you can see that the tube is released, the nuclei kind of dance around each other, you see them separating for a second and they leave together. Um, so just so we can all be seeing the same thing, we can look at the chymograph instead. And uh, you can see uh, one of the arrows here points to uh, where we think the nuclei start reorganizing, which is very shortly after the tube starts to release. Um, and then you can see that they exit the tube together. 
Um, okay, so then uh, the next question was how do they actually travel down the tube? And so now we'll I'll show you a movie of them uh, traveling down the tube. Uh, so that looks like this. And so what you see here is that they, they get deformed quite a lot. So just uh, the spores at the bottom, you see that they kind of go through, you see the spore jump a little bit at the end as well. Um, and just to orient you, I'll you know, make the marking of where the, where the tube would be. And so maybe if we look at this as a chymograph, um, what I would like to point out is that the, there is like a pretty gross deformation of these nuclei as they, they go through and then they kind of pause and jump out. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that they do uh, regain their shape at the end. So that is, that is reversible. Um, and so they kind of uh, really get deformed to squeeze through the tube and then reform, I guess, as they exit. Um, okay, so uh, so I told you now a lot of stuff that is basically observational and very descriptive. We looked at velocities and phases of extrusion and, and timing of cargo transport and all of these different things. And I guess now comes the hard part of trying to make some meaning of this. And so uh, what we, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that we really have a mechanism yet, but I'm going to try to end by putting it all together in um, what we think is a plausible model now. So first, uh, we'll just go back to what does it look like. So here I've combined uh, data. So the data and the bright colors are directly from the uh, serial block based imaging. And then we've drawn in some um, lightly shaded and dotted things that come from data that I, I didn't show you today, but we have a bit more complete picture of we know how the nuclei are related to where the tube is. Um, and so this is the general rearrangement. Nuclei are kind of cupped inside uh, um, the polar tube here. Um, sure. okay. yes. There's a, a question about, is it the nucleus that's traveling or just the DNA or what, what is going through the, the tube? I also have that question, and I, I don't know the answer. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I, I, we really don't know what else is. So it could be the whole entire, you could, um, you know, one thing could be the whole entire cell with its plasma membrane and everything. Here, so here we only use the nuclei as a marker. So, you know, that's, that was all that we saw, but we don't know if, um, if it could be the whole cell or if something's left behind. Um, we do have some, data. Um, so we, we used, uh, we were trying to address this question at the beginning. Um, and we used various dyes, right, that are just available. Of course, the caveat is whether they are staining what we think they're staining in microsporidia, I don't know. Um, but when we used mitotracker, which I'm pretty sure was not staining, they, they have mitosomes, not mitochondria. Mitosomes are like a little remnant of mitochondria. Um, they have double membranes, but they don't actually have DNA. Um, but anyway, I, I couldn't tell you what it's staining, but some of the data suggested that that whatever that was kind of stays behind in the spore. So it's possible that there is some selectivity of what's going through, but I think that's very preliminary and I, I'm not quite sure how much of it to believe myself. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Okay, so if we now uh, kind of put this all together, uh, the um, EM and the light microscopy. Um, so we have this polar tube that's coiled around these two nuclei and it's anchored to the spore wall with this anchoring disc. Um, we know that at, when we apply some stimulus at the thinnest part of uh, the spore is where that init initiation of the firing occurs and the tube will start to fire. Um, okay, and then uh, we know that this firing happens, say, about, uh, let's say, an average of 200 microns per second. The nuclei translocation are also, um, I would say, in a similar ballpark. Um, and the other thing that we know is when it's about 50% extended is when the nuclei start to travel through the tube. They would then get, um, as you saw, completely deformed as they travel through um, and emerge at the other end. And so if we put uh, some, some time scales on this, um, the time before the cargo exits is also about the time where the tube is 50% is extended. Um, 
and uh, maybe we can come back and if we have an extended discussion at the end about, about what this may mean, but I think it, can, it could potentially tell us about the mechanism of the polar tube extending. Uh, the whole uh, event is over in about 1.6 seconds for this species and faster for others. So, Europe. okay, yeah. So, sorry again. Uh, so Yifan wants to know about the technical feasibility of doing a series section image to the spores that have already fired. I've got so, that right. Uh, we have done that, but we don't have any, um, we, we have the data, but not processed yet. So I don't, I mean, we've germinated and done the serial block phase imaging. And now, I don't think we can, I don't think we'd be able to see the much about the tube itself because it's so thin. Um, about like 100 nanometers, but I think we it would tell us about the rearrangements within the spore as the tube is firing, if we're able to capture it in enough uh, states. So I think. And then, oh, yep. No, so I was just saying I think we have to. I hope. Yeah, we were uh, the one issue with this is um, using so the software Dragonfly. Uh, you kind of need the touch screen and the workstation is set up, you know, in the, in the EM suite. And so we're kind of basically waiting to go back there. And then someone anonymous attendee asks whether uh, with whatever material is being transferred, whether it's the nucleus or just the DNA, is there any indication whether the transport is active, facilitated by motors in some structure? So. Yeah, um, I think it would be very unlikely to be motors just because of the speed that it's going at. Um, so I think I think that most likely um, the force that is, well, I don't know where the force is coming from, but it's, I would guess that it's coupled to the extension itself. Um, but I, I don't know for sure. And that is, so that's one of the questions on the um, sort of open questions that I thought could be uh, also fun to discuss where, where the force is coming from for the extrusion and also for the transport. Um, but yeah, I think it would be unlikely to be motors given the velocity. And then uh, on that theme, Yifan again asked whether you, I guess, have quantification of that force and, and or the pressure uh, prior to no, so I, ha I haven't seen it in the literature and we don't have that, but I would love to discuss with Ifan later what would be the best way to actually measure that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I guess uh, some of the open questions here are uh, kind of alluded to this, but the tube could either be getting pushed out as a spring or the whole thing could be getting inverted if you imagine like turning a, the sleeve of your sweatshirt inside out or something. Um, and it's unclear, although I, I think it's probably that, but I don't think we really have data to show that yet. Um, also, yeah, where is the force coming from as, as we asked, and that's, I think the third one's also been asked, what is the cargo apart from the nucleus? It's very challenging uh, to just even obtain stains for the relevant cargoes, you know, so, um, that's something that we'd like to do. Um, the cargo transport was particularly interesting uh, to us because we didn't go into it expecting to see the nucleus deformed to that state, at that extent. And um, so we were kind of wondering, well, what is the chromatin state? Uh, does the nuclear envelope actually break down? Um, and, you know, how some, of course, we've seen from, uh, from many groups, uh, you know, movies of, of cells crawling through small spaces like tumor cells penetrating tissues and nuclei also deformed there. I think the biggest difference is the time scale and the extent of deformation because usually that's maybe say minutes to hours and this is all in within on the millisecond time scale. Um, so I think uh, those kind of questions would be very interesting to, to try to address. Um, other kind of directions that are uh, other sort of directions in the lab looking at this are the actual structure of the tube itself, the polar tube proteins, just through doing recombinant proteins. And, um, and of course, we're super interested in the, con the conformational change at high resolution of all of this uh, when it goes from the inside to the outside. And kind of on the other side of things, um, we are interested in looking at this in the context of host cells. 
Um, so one thing I'm really excited about is um, Noel, who's a postdoc in the lab, is now setting up uh, an, an intestinal organoid system, model system to, to really look at this in more detail, which I think will give us much better uh, 3D architecture um, to really address these questions of invasion, as well as cell-to-cell -cell spread and uh, the host response. And so um, with that, I will end. And so I, um, I really want to thank um, everyone in the lab. But so Damien and I uh, run our lab together, and this has been just super fun and allows us to have, you know, a broad range of projects that um, we really love doing. And uh, Michael, who is, is here taking the selfie, he's always the selfie takeover. Uh, yeah, he has really uh, done everything for this project. Uh, like I said, it didn't exist in the lab before he got there. Um, and we've also worked really closely with the microscopy call. Um, okay, so I think I am happy to take more questions and discuss anything. Awesome. Well, great. Um, I, I know that the attendees can't react, but I will uh, clap or give, you know, Zoom crab hands. Uh, that, was, that was awesome. Um, I'm going to uh, try an experiment. Uh, and allow my colleague Clem uh, to talk and, and ask a question. Clem, if you can unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Oh. Yep, cool. we can hear you, Clem. Perfect. Yeah, I was wondering, in the species where there's two high gear, this is awesome talk, by the way, but um, in the species with two nuclei, do both of the nuclei get transported through the tube? And if so, do they merge first and then they transport as one unit or do they uh, or do they sort of go as two boli of nuclei in the tube? I think they go um, together. So let me just try to get us back to this movie. Um, so I have to say that be, uh, this kind of imaging has been like just incredibly challenging. And so with all the other stuff, we have, you know, like 20 or 30 events that we can then quantify. And with this, um, this was like maybe one of two movies that we were able to really do this dual imaging for. So with that caveat in mind, um, here you can watch the two of them together. And so it seems like you can see them clearly separate, but then they do leave at the same time. So I think that they would be basically traveling together. Cool. Oh, it's all good. Next, I'm going to activate Subu. Subu to unmute. We get five, four, three, two, one. All right. Subu wanted to ask why is it important for the microsporidia to shoot out the polar tube at such high speeds? Is it to pierce the host membrane or? something else. It could be. So um, this uh, movie that I'm showing on the bottom left here, if it shows up for you, um, you can see a microsporidia spore and a, there's a host cell. So here's the host cell. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, but the uh, tube does seem to kind of latch onto the host cell in some way. Piercing. Um, so yes, that's the hypothesis, the general understanding in the field is that it would pierce. Uh, there's not any clear data for the actual piercing event, I would say. So I have not ruled out that that it would just be, um, you know, releasing its sporoplasm or releasing the cargo and that getting into the host cell. I don't feel like there's any clear data to differentiate those two, but it certainly could be piercing. And, and maybe on a related note, Oren asks, why does it need to do this at a distance from the host cell? Why not just go right up next to the host cell? I know, right? That's bizarre. Um, so yeah, so I guess uh, it, so it could be to penetrate some mucus layer or something. I'm completely speculating, by the way. I have no data on anything. But um, yeah, so it could be to kind of get through some sort of mucus layer since it's going to, you know, so several of them may be going into intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, the other thing that we've been thinking about is whether it's not it may not be necessary to 
initiate infection. Maybe it's for cell to cell spread. Um, and so I didn't show any of this today, but we've been looking at a little bit at kind of cell entry and certainly the whole spore can get phagocytosed as well. And other people have shown that for some species too. And so the, the question we don't know is, I mean, the answer that we don't know is whether that event is a productive infection. And I think to address that, we'd have to follow single events, both with polar tube firing as well as with um, phagocytosis of the whole spore to see if they actually replicate. And that's something that we are doing now. Um, but yeah, in a real tissue, maybe it's more for spreading than uh, infecting. Matt? Yeah, hi, Gira. This was a, a really fascinating talk. I'm struck by the confirmation of the PT inside the cell and why you might think it sort of is at an angle there versus some other kind of confirmation. Have you thought about that? So we've thought about it. I don't really have a satisfactory answer because I, I mean we haven't tried to do any sort of simulations or anything to see how it would affect the shooting um i uh, i did get a criticism on my grant that uh, the most efficient way would be if it were packed not at an angle um so i guess someone maybe that's faster shooting out i don't know but i no, i don't have any clear answer on that but if you have any specific thoughts i would love to hear them No, I guess I was just wondering that same thing about what would be the most efficient way to pack it inside there. And um, no, I hadn't hadn't thought it all the way through, but for some reason it stuck in my mind that it was interesting. Yeah, we also were initially, like all of the models and the textbooks and stuff show it just kind of, you know, planar. And I was, kind of, I was also expecting to see it that way and could be to accommodate other organelles as well. Um, but one, one of the things um, that we're interested in doing is kind of looking at the development of it, how it's actually built. So maybe doing initially doing the serial block based imaging with uh, spores that are not fully developed. And maybe, maybe that would give some insight into how it actually is packed that way. Okay, next from a uh, galaxy far, far away, Princess Leia Lucas, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question comment? Go, going once, going twice. Okay. Um, easy questions to ask. What is the diameter of the polar tube? Uh, yeah, so it's about a hundred nanometers. And um, and can you give us more details on the intestinal system that you are setting up? Um, yeah, so we are current, this is very, very new. So we are currently um, just using enteroids that uh, we have been able to establish. So if we disrupt them, we're able to establish microsporidia infection in them, but we need to try to flip them to make them apical out so that the relevant surface is actually exposed for the microsporidia infection. And we haven't got there yet, but we have seen that um, when we uh, you know, when we just grow them and disrupt them and then add in microsporidia, we can establish an infection in them. But we don't, yeah, we don't have anything more to share yet. Hi, Gira. Uh, Ruchika. Uh, hi, Gira, this is Ruchika. Uh, uh, hi, um, very nice work, actually. I was just wondering, in one of the graph you had was uh, in which, you know, you showed the Michael Menten kind of kinetics, like saturation kinetics and also... Uh, sigmoidal curve on the base of time versus the yeah uh, so i was wondering that if uh, that depends upon uh, nature of the protein your polar tube has and uh, how does actually that correlate it? i mean any cooperativity in that kind of process yeah so it's true that the um so the polar tube proteins i didn't get into them but so that that's kind of interesting there are three main um ones that have been identified that are thought to potentially be like the struct structural basis of this tube. So they're just called polar tube protein one, two, and three, um, and they're not related to anything. So there's not much I can tell you about them. Um, but those, you know, so one possibility is that all three of them come together to form some sort of repeating unit that then makes the tube. Could also be that one of them is a scaffold and the other two do something else. Um, but it is true that they are more closely related in the blue and orange one than they are in the black one. Uh, although in the end, I mean, the 
I mean, I think overall there's going to be some common mechanism. Uh, but yeah, the, the proteins are, they can be pretty divergent anywhere. They can be, you know, up to 70% similar. They can also be down to sort of on the more like 15 to 20%. And then they get into the stage where you can't really, you don't really know if it's the same protein that you're looking at in different species. Thank you. Arthur? Yes. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, in order to investigate the role of the vacuole in the shooting process, have you tried to change the osmolarity and see if it triggers or if it changes the speed at which it shoots or any of the parameters of the shooting? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. So we uh, haven't done that. So some um, Emily Trommel and uh, Jimmy Becknell are uh, have worked on one of these species, algae, and although they didn't do like a quantitative assay, they, they were initially showing this polar tube firing and they did some really nice uh, life cell imaging to look at it. And you can see as the tube um, fires that vacuole kind of expanding. Um, I'm not sure if that's a consequence of the firing or if that's actually causing in a way uh, the firing. Um, we haven't played around, so so uh, we haven't played around yet with osmolarity, viscosity, or any anything, which I think would be really important to do in terms of um, kind of nailing the mechanism. So that's something that we hope to do, and then do it in a more quantitative way like this, where we can really do it for you know 30, 40 spores, and then get some numbers out. Uh, great, uh, Yifan. Yes, I, you know, I still have that same question. The, how does it find in the target? Because this, uh, if you look at the trace of this prototype, it looks yeah. like a missile, right? It shoots out and directly to its target. And then if you look at the last image, uh, the, one of this movie in your acknowledgement slides, yeah. and it seems like in that firing, the if first one of these things, first missed off its target, then it's kind of swing. In one of you, yeah, some of them you can see the first fire into a different location. And mm -hmm. how does it actually find in the target? And does this thing ever fire into a wrong direction in the completely opposite direction? Uh, yes, so there's often kind of off target, like if, so I mean, so one hypothesis is that there is a target, uh, most likely, like here you can see there probably is, but there's also a spore actually firing off to the left that I don't think. Yeah finding its target. Um, and so you, you do often see that. And so to some extent, um, it happens. Almost, I mean, it's, pro, it's not, I'm sure it's not spontaneous in real life, but uh, mm. that there must be some, some trigger. But I do, um, I do wonder if it's more like a tissue level trigger. Uh, and I'm sure- It doesn't matter, so matter which way you fire. Yeah. You can always reach a target because if it doesn't reach a target, it seems like this guy is going to be die. Yes, right? that's true. But I mean, that's also true, I guess, even in viruses to have like a large percentage that are just not, uh, you know, I see, not productive. And so, I, I mean, the other option, like I was saying, is it could be that it's more for cell to cell spread. And maybe if we study that in the context of its real tissue architecture, like it could be that that in, in, um, some C. elegans systems that have been studied, it seems like once they start infecting it, they cause the whole, the whole um, intestine to become one syncytium. And so, you know, it, you could imagine that this kind of mechanism was, is useful for that kind of spreading across many cells, perhaps, because it's long. Okay, that's fine. It's very cool, thanks. Um, all right, uh, John, John Wang. Give you so the the question was the invasion uh, results in the host having slow growth. How how does it multiply itself in the host? And I guess a related question is you know where do the cells divide? Is it inside the host? Can you transfect the host cell with the genome of the uh, microsporidia? Would it produce more spores, etc.? Yeah. So don't know a lot of those answers, but um, the slow growth syndrome, I think it's 
uh, it just you I, I mean my guess would be it's just using a lot of the host uh, metabolites and such like for example it doesn't uh, produce ATP but it upregulates ATP transporters um, and then I think and so that's something we're interested in looking at as well as like what's the niche in the host cell is it kind of you know snuggling up to the mitochondria and, and basically draining that and so no one's really studied the slow growth syndrome um, and so I, I I'm, I think it's probably just that. Uh, so some species for replication, uh, so actually one of them that I showed you uh, will just replicate in the host cytoplasm. The other one actually goes into this um, parasitophorous vacuole um, and, and it basically, uh, so it's then in the vacuole and replicates there. And so that is, um, yeah, that's somewhat species dependent and also not super well studied. What, why is your dog wearing the ridiculous comb? <laughs> um, she has a ulcer on her cornea and she's super naughty. Oh no. All right, Matt. Hey, yeah, thank you for uh, an awesome talk. I was just um, curious, has anyone tried uh, maybe like single molecule experiments with the, the filament? to maybe try and characterize some of the physical properties like elasticity. Um, and so can you, when you say single molecule experiments, you mean like optical trap kind of? Uh, yeah, exactly, like force experiments. Um, not to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I haven't seen that, but I do think that would actually be very interesting to do. Great, Clem? <laughs> hey, Gira. Um, Quick question, can you shear the tubes off and purify them? Like if you grow a bunch of yeast and yeah. you know, induce the tubes and then maybe put them on the grid and maybe then image them or something? Yeah, so, uh, so the thing you see on the right is one picture, one cryo, one tomogram uh, uh, yeah, projection that you see from a similar experiment where we just kind of put the spores on the grid and you actually don't have to shear them even. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the shearing is actually important for, uh, we kind of also want to get at like, what is the proteome of this tube? Because the uh, people have kind of looked at these main polar tube proteins, um, but that's because they're extremely resistant to, so they're resistant to like uh, eight molar urea and uh, large amounts of SDS. And so the way it's been done before is just to dissolve the whole spore and that, and then these are the proteins that kind of remain, and then you can identify them by mass spec. But we wanted to do exactly what you said and uh, for getting like a better idea of what else is in the tube, because also one sort of dream experiment is to be able to reconstitute it, and because then we could really manipulate things. Um, and so uh, we were able to optimize uh, sonication actually to just, cut off the most of it and then break it down uh we might yeah we're still kind of optimizing i guess the cryo em for that and so it i don't know if it's better to have the sonicated pieces or just go with the whole tube uh, one advantage of the whole tube is we could potentially go down all 100 microns and see how similar it is along the whole mm -hmm. length of it. hey last question Ruchika. <laughs> Oh, hi, Gira. Uh, sorry for the uh, another, another question, but I was just wondering, like, you know, you also showed in one of the slides that uh, the polar tube was increasing by step by step, like, you know, a few steps. So I was just wondering that if there is a chemotaxis involved in the process to reach the target. It certainly could be some something that is sensing, something that's secreted by the host cell. Um, the, or by... Sorry? Or by him, uh, or by itself as well. Spore itself. Yeah, it, it's a, it could be. Although it seems like it's very um, like it's you know it's like it has a sort of chitin wall around it as well. I don't know how much it would secrete from there. It's pretty kind of closed up. And then once it fires, it seems like everything is you know that's your one shot. Um, so I don't know if it's by itself, but it certainly could be by the host cell. Thank you for answering that. Okay. Well, with that, um, let's all thank Gira. I think I'm the only person who can make any noise. So uh, yay uh, for a great seminar. That was fascinating. Tons of interest um, from 
uh, the audience. Lots of great questions. Um, Gina or Alexa, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but otherwise, um, thank you. We're, we're sorry we don't get to host you in person, but we look forward to having you uh, back on campus sometime in the future. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Amazing.